Welcome, Welcome to, to Sam Culture. Oh, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have an intro. Really I'm going to Welcome to STEM Culture Podcast. Hi! <laughs> that was so excited. <laughs> That's Danny. <laughs> and I'm Monsi. This is the first episode I get to lead since joining the podcast. So it's very exciting. Yeah. Who else do we have here? I'm Will. Oh my god. <laughs> who's basically Eeyore. Wow, that was so Eeyore. Okay. <laughs> I'm Danny, who's basically Tigger. <laughs> and this is Brooke. Am I Piglet? Oh. Yeah. And I'm Zach, who doesn't... I'm I'm the rabbit, let's yes. be honest. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. <laughs> and I'm back. <laughs> so I am super excited. I just wanted to share with the audience that I just uh, completed my second open strongman competition. Woo! <laughs> Got some PRs, Killing pulled some heavy it. things, loaded some heavy things, and uh, you know I'm at the kind of the beginning of my strength journey. But I'm excited to move on to the next contest prep in January, and I wanted to give everybody else here an opportunity to share anything exciting that has happened to them in the last week. Any wins, goals, met? I didn't quit my PhD. Yes, that's a win. We're so Yay. proud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a real loser. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no accomplishment. I'll share kind of a win that I think maybe some people don't think about, but I was able to really think deeply on the projects that I want to accomplish in my PhD. And I know that sounds kind of, um, I guess, like not that big of a big of a deal, but I feel like it's really important to think about all the things that you want to accomplish and then how you're going to do that. Um, because some of the things are not within the realm of my dissertation. They're beyond that, but I think they're just as important. So I was able to kind of map those things out, which this is the first time I've really taken the time to sit down and, and map out to the very end. So, like, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. So I think that was really cool. Nice. That's awesome. You're a smart girl. Smart lady. Thank you. Will, do you have any wins? Any goals met? Um, I put on the same socks this morning. As on, what? On both feet. Oh. <laughs> like matching yeah, socks. Woo. Matching socks. Yeah, yes. Yes. <laughs> Very and exciting. I don't think I was late to anything today. Yay! Yay! That's nice. really good. That's wonderful. So proud. Okay, I thought of something that's like positive, but Will, are you, were you done yet? I was interrupting you. I also finalized the figures for my first publication. Yes! That's, yes! Super exciting. That's amazing. You're going to show them to us later, right? Yeah. Yes. Time permitting. <laughs> Not on air. Quiet over there, rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to say. Um, my, my more positive thing is that um, I've been struggling lately uh, with my mental health. And so this week, um, or rather this weekend, I decided that I was going to prioritize me and my goals. And like I give my time and, and efforts towards a lot of other things. And I've canceled all of it except the podcast yes. so that I can focus on my PhD and my mental health and the podcast. And that's it. And that's taken a big load off my shoulders and it makes me um, happy. That's Yay. wonderful. Happy. What's that word again? <laughs> happy. happy. <laughs> <laughs> Please <Yes>. define. <laughs> Happiness. Yeah. Yes. It's, it's a strange <laughs> word. <Yeah. laughs> So this episode goes out to all of you brave, brave first-year graduate students and you bitter fifth years talking to Danny. Yep. <laughs> Don't forget those bitter six years. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I'm dead inside. We love you, Rabbit. It's a normal part of the process. <laughs> Are the tears? <laughs> yes. So... Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most important relationships that you will have during your time in graduate school, the relationship with your PI. 
Today, we're going to be discussing the importance of that PI graduate student relationship, tips for how to develop that relationship, meeting with your PI about expectations for your first year, the importance of asking direct questions and having some self-reflection. And then we're actually going to talk about what we would do if we could go back in time. So first, I want to read this quote. The delicate balance of mentoring someone is not creating them in your own image, but giving them the opportunity to create themselves. I think this quote nicely leads us into the main topic of developing a relationship with your PI. And the reason that I do is because there's two sides to it. It's not only how your PI should be, how, how a mentor should be proceeding in a relationship, but it's also how the mentee or the grad student should be proceeding in their part of the relationship. So you're taking the tools that your PI gives you and creating something new and interesting and creative. So your PI is, is really your academic parent. All of their knowledge and scientific methods will at some point flow through you, starting a new part of a cycle that enriches the next generations and prepares them for the next scientific discovery. So we build off of their achievement, which ties into the title of this episode. Keeping in mind the importance of this person to our academic development, I think it is important to acknowledge it's a two-way street. If you, we, I don't take some responsibility, we're leaving mentoring up to a PI who has probably no training doesn't know what you need, is not a mind reader. However, how they interact with you isn't connected to whether or not they care about you. I think that's an important caveat to not uh, misinterpret a PI's treatment of you for, for dislike. This is more about the fact that they just may not know what to do, especially with a grad student that doesn't fit the mold of their expectations. So if you put the onus on your PI to lead you through grad school, I think you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Now, this may not apply to everybody. If your PI is especially difficult to interact with, then this isn't really the episode for you. You're in a tough situation. And if you are in that situation, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, reach out to us on Instagram or Twitter and let us know if you're in that situation of having a difficult PI so we can talk about maybe a future episode about how to navigate a complicated PI grad student relationship. So I think this relationship building consists of figuring out a roadmap for your relationship and how you're going to work together for the next five to eight years. It took me about seven and a half years to graduate. So I think that's a nice range, five to eight years. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so in other words, you're negotiating this working relationship and it should hopefully satisfy both parties. So when I talk about the things that, that you should be thinking about that you might need from your PI that you should communicate to them, it's things like, well, maybe you're the type of person that needs to be daily briefed. You need to go see them in their office every day. Or maybe you're a student that just needs to chat once a month, or maybe you need lots of positive feedback, or maybe you just need a little bit to get you going. Maybe you need a frequent manuscript review and you struggle with writing, or maybe you're just one of those people who can just, you know, uh, pound out a paper and you only need a, a couple of drafts to be evaluated. So how do you take responsibility for your experience and how do you navigate developing a relationship with your PI? That's the focus of today's episode. I wanted to take a second um, and talk about mentorship more generally and then sort of come back to the PI relationship. But I think that uh, that it's important to sort of lay the foundation in a more general sense because uh, mentorship is a really important thing. It's a really important idea for, for human beings. Um, so I like to think of it as the most genuine form of education, which means literally leading out. And you could think of it as leading out of the darkness of ignorance. Um, and this is a fundamental human activity. So, uh, you know, people's power uh, is not in their claws or, or, or how fast they can run. Um, but it's in their ability to pass information from generation to generation. Um, and that's what mentorship is at the core of. It's uh, um, the personal and collaborative transmission of knowledge from a person who is an expert and has experience to someone who wants to be an expert and have experience. Um, and as such, I think... Um, that it is, in a really human way, the foundation of society. Um, and because it's 
so I think built into us, I think that we're actually probably wired to feel very satisfied by uh, engaging in genuine mentorship, uh, either as the mentor or as a mentee. I think that you're just set up to know when you have a real, uh, you know, trusted advisor who will help to educate you. Um, and so in general, I think that it's important for everyone to go out and do both things. Um, be a mentor to somebody and also find yourself a mentor. Um, and, you know, this involves building trust. This involves, uh, you know, open communication and, and a lot of the other things that we're going to talk about. But um, just like anything else, the scope of the mentorship is important. Um, so are you, uh, are you teaching or learning how to peel potatoes or are you teaching or learning how to become a scientist? And I think it's clear that the latter is a much broader, impactful and difficult thing to teach or learn um, because it's so interleaved with every part of who you are as a person. And that's the job of the PI and also the grad student. So here we are back at PIs. What do you guys think? I think French fries are really important to me emotionally and physically. So um... yeah, peeling potatoes <laughs> is a serious job, man. Yeah. Got to feed people. I'm not a man. <laughs> I love that. I love that. You're so philosophical. Sorry. You're welcome. And, um, and, uh... <laughs> can I also add it's it's mo it's very Agent Smith listening to this conversation. I, I felt very much like I was sitting in the presence of Agent Smith. Who's that? Matrix. The Matrix. Oh. Hugo so Weaving. I prefer I prefer Lord Elrond. Thank I, you. I that, yes, Lord Elrond <laughs> if I was the better pick... character. But like he really made that part like, yeah, he amazing. Did. So anyways. Wow. Moving on. <laughs> I like what you had to say about there being like this like hardwired thing about the, the the feeling good after an interaction with a PI yeah. or a mentor. I think that's that really resonated with me. I think that all the good interactions I've ever had with a mentor always left me with that that really good feeling. I guess it's like endorphins flooding or Yeah, you walk good. away really truly excited mm -hmm. about what you're doing and, and not doubting yourself and feeling like, okay, I'm I've made the right decision and whatever it is that you were having the discussion about. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So and what about the other side of that? I know for a fact that both you guys have been mentors to people in different mm -hmm. capacities too. So do you get a similar feeling when you know that you've made that connection with somebody and you've you've helped them get across a threshold or something like that. Yeah, I think um, uh, I, I think it's pretty exciting when you're able to have that connection and help somebody in a way that maybe you wished you had been, like somebody had been there for you. Um, I think it's a great, great feeling, you know, to feel like you made a difference in somebody's life in some aspect. Absolutely. I also really liked when you mentioned that, you know, mentorship doesn't necessarily have to come only from your PI or your supervisor. There's other people where you can actually go out and get mentorship from someone who is not like your set person. Mm -hmm. um, and you can make them your set person uh, with their consent. <laughs> <laughs> make them with their consent. I like right, that. Right. Yeah. I, I, I made Zach mentor me in D&D. &D. <laughs> it's a work he, in progress. He did not consent. <laughs> Next, we want to move on to some tips. So for everyone on the podcast today, which is literally everybody, what is the most important tip you would recommend to develop a relationship with your PI? Go first. Oh. Oh. Your, <laughs> By the way, bitch. Your tip is first. So. I hate it. Okay. So my tip is to stop into your PI's office and just chat with them. 
Uh, it can be about science at first. That might be more comfortable, but talk to them about careers, what you want to do in the future. Talk to them about life. Um, that was a big thing for me and my PIs. He, he would often ask me how my weekend went. And that encouraged me to really think about, oh, what did I do with my weekend? And he actually wanted to know how it went. So it encouraged me to think about that and have a work-life balance. But sometimes because we built that comfortability with each other, I would then be like, oh, actually I had a thought about my PhD, about this project, about this experiment. And then I was able to, you know, through that conversation, um, get a, a, a bit further along in my PhD as well. Yeah. I um, So I guess I'll build on that just because Danny and I have the same PI. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I do really like that about our PI is that, you know, it, he's always said from day one that the most important thing no matter what, is that he makes time for us as far as like if something's going on in his office and I have something that I need to chat with him about, he'll never turn me away. And I think that's really, really great because there's times where you just have this thought that you need to discuss right away. Um, but I think the most important tip that um, has really helped me is that I know um, he likes coffee in the morning. And so I think a great time for us to kind of connect about like whatever it is that we need to chat about, I make sure I get there in the morning and I come with my coffee cup and I'm like, hey, who needs coffee? <laughs> and so I've kind of, you know, we we figured out that that's a great time for us to chat about all things. Um and brainstorm things and we walk to the little coffee stand and then we come back and we chat about all the things that we need to a couple times a week and I think it's a really important time for us to check in because we might not have that time during a lab meeting where we have a full lab of a lot of things that we need to accomplish in an hour but that's something I know I can keep whatever communication I need with him during the week is with those coffee walks. So that's, you know, find something that you can connect with your PI about and just keep that connection going. Find your own coffee walk. That's right. <laughs> find your own coffee walk. <laughs> yeah, my, my tip is, is, I don't know if it's the number one most important thing, but, but it, it certainly fits in with what Brooke and Danny were talking about, which is, you know, uh, building, building a human relationship with your PI that's not just a scientific relationship and one thing that you might try to do is sort of like fun stuff outside of science if if they have the time and interest and 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 you do so maybe find a uh an appropriate common interest like golfing or fishing or uh tipping back a brewski or uh, <laughs> I love that that's a common interest. <laughs> I think it, it is a common interest for many people. <laughs> but maybe there's a trivia night at the, you know, at the brew pub that that you're both think would be fun or something like that. Mm -hmm. But just just make it, uh, you know, make it a real a real human relationship and not just an exclusively scientific relationship. Mm -hmm. Team building like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Escape room. Yeah, yes. we, we, like, we didn't if you're locked in a room together they have to answer your questions <laughs> <laughs> they have to review your manuscript draft uh -huh. right there <laughs> RPIs literally have night room nightmares about that <laughs> so do I uh, so. oh uh, me okay so uh, my uh, big suggestion is to be kind of the non-Newtonian mentee which is you're 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 very fluid when you need to be, but when pressure is applied, you become rigid and firm about what you need to do. So my big thing is scheduling issues with my PI. Time management is not anybody's forte in my lab, and so with that, if somebody says, "Oh, I'm not available at that time," or they miss a meeting, then my immediate response is, "Okay, when are we meeting? Let's get that in your calendar. Let's block that now." And so you have to be rigid in that terminology or that that state of mind of "I will meet with you." we're going to figure this out and the flexibility comes from maneuvering your schedule. But I also think a really good thing is like my PI loves data. 
if I promise data of some form, he'll probably meet with me. So as long as you're being, <laughs> as long as you're being productive, you could probably get their attention. You found his coffee. I was like, yeah. you like Excel sheets? I got Excel sheets. <laughs> hey man, hey man, hey man, five five dollars for four Excel sheets. <laughs> you want to see your chromatogram? I got chromatogram. Data man. Data. <laughs> like, you ain't gonna find data cheaper than my data. <laughs> Sometimes you got to be his street pharmacist of data, and that's, so, that's necessary. So uh, uh, building on that again, because we all build on everything that everyone says, um, <laughs> you can also be flexible in terms of thinking about the work that you're doing together. So, um, you know, your uh, knowledge and your and expertise and your, your PA, PIs may not be the same. And so one thing you can do is just be very conscious about uh about when you're talking about your work together like when it is that you should defer to your pi's expertise and when it is that you should speak up and say well actually i know about this and this is the direction we should go and i think that that will make you feel more valuable in the relationship demonstrate to your pi that you're an active participant and uh and also um avoid the situation that you know, you predicted something wasn't going to work and then it doesn't and you didn't say anything. And if something comes up where the experiment didn't work, it would be best to say, I tried this also come up with alternatives before you come and present it. Cause nobody wants to hear just bad news come in with, Oh, this didn't work. I modified this and tried this. It also wasn't successful. I'm here to ask you for more input on where we should go. And like Will said, we're probably the experts in our field when it comes to a few things, just because I, my PI has four students. He doesn't have time to read all the in-depth articles of my research topic, so I've probably read 30 or 40 more on one topic than he has. So we're the ones who can say, actually, no, that's not accurate anymore. That's 30-year-old research. We've moved forward since then. So the tip that I have is actually very specific to the type of advisor that I had during my time getting my PhD. He sort of struggled with personal relationships. It was hard to get him to talk about his family. And I would only talk about my family if it was, you know, sort of like a nuclear disaster or something. And so for that, it was a little, it was a little complicated because I couldn't really connect with him in a more personal way. And so I'm coming at this from just the, the concept that I, I needed to be more honest about when I didn't understand something. And part of that, the reason why I didn't always was because he could be a little bit critical and sometimes condescending. And, and he would admit later that he was that way and was trying to work on it towards the end of our relationship. But um, that was how I was met. And I should have just been okay with taking that intense criticism from him. Maybe I'd go cry later. But if I had been honest with him about my shortcomings, about the things that I wasn't quite understanding or getting from him, a statistical analysis or a method or something, if I had just done that, he would have been like, you're an idiot, but then he would have helped me. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to echo that is whenever I leave my office or the, my PI's office after a meeting, I normally am taking notes and then I'll just say, just so we're clear, this is what you're looking for me to do. Mm -hmm. Before I come back to a next meeting, that to-do list is accomplished. Or if there's an issue, I'll address that. Before. Yeah, that's a great Yeah. yeah. Always have a to-do list and something to follow up. I, I always say, thanks for having this meeting. Here's what I'm going to mm -hmm. do. I'll get back to you when this is finished. Yeah, that's really that's smart. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, so next we're going to talk about um, meeting with your PI and, and really understanding what your expectations and their expectations are that first year. I think it's really important to um, set this up because this really kind of sets the tone of what – you know, your time during your PhD will be. Um, I didn't do this, um, but I'll explain why I guess I didn't really have to. Um, but I, I think first I'm going to say, you know, I think a great way to do this with your PI is that you need a notebook for starting in the lab. And I think this is a good time to break in your new notebook have a meeting with your PI 
and just see what it is that they want from you because you're going to have on top of, um, at least if you're in the U.S., you're going to have the expectation of taking classes and of teaching. And so in that time frame, you know, those first couple of years, what are the expectations are you supposed to be learning lab work from maybe your lab mates or are you supposed to be um, just focusing on your classes and teaching and kind of getting grips with your first year? So um, the reason why I didn't have that discussion with my PI was because I had really amazing lab mates who filled me in on what the expectations were because that's what uh, his expectations were of them. Um, had I not had that already, I would have, I would have hoped that I would have taken the time to do this with my PI because being a little baby grad student, you don't know, you, you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> like you're just clueless, I think for the first year. I don't think anybody walks in going, I know what I'm doing. Um, at least Twitter tells me that. Um, <laughs> it must be true then. <laughs> yeah. The internet has spoken. <laughs> yeah, but um, did any of you have that where – I know Danny did because she's the one who guided me on this. <laughs> but did any of you have, um, I guess, a, a time to kind of talk with your PI about what those expectations were? Um, or was that something that you really didn't even think about? I'm curious. I had that experience. Uh, I think it was more my advisor taking the lead on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my PI was actually very good about about telling me what he expected for me in my first year. And he was very kind about that. My first semester, he was just like, take your classes, get used to, you know, being a grad student, go to seminars, start thinking about, you know, start reading a bunch of papers and just relax your first semester. It's not, you're not really relaxing, right? No, no. So you're taking a bunch of uh, intense classes. At least I took some really intense classes my first semester and some of them out of the department in the geology department. They were, they were great, but, but he was very good about that. And he was very good about keeping me on track for most things until we got kind of closer to the end. And then it was just like, oh, I'm floating in the ether. I don't know what's going on. So then I had to, I had to be the one who really pushed at the final that final stage to, to, to get the dissertation written and to get it submitted and to defend. But up until that point, it had been pretty, he'd been pretty good about that. I would say that, um, my advisor and I met a lot in my first semester, uh, to plan my dissertation work. Um, and I think that the expectations for, uh, for my work and pace and communication were sort of set um, implicitly. Um, but I have a, a pretty great advisor who is pretty intentional about setting a good example and you know uh, you know one thing one thing he he said to me at one point was you know I was like you know um, yeah, I sort of felt like I had I had like something up. And he sort of said to me, listen, if I'm ever pissed off at you or I'm ever unhappy with something that you've done, I will tell you, which sounds simple and like basic, but also in terms of like, you know, I mean, how many people can you 100% say that that's true about in your life? I mean, I've got family members that I... I'm 35 and I walk around going, are they mad at me? <laughs> <laughs> I've known them my entire life. I'm, I don't know. So I think that's a really exceptional thing. It's a very good thing. Um, and, and then, you know, in terms of the, the work itself, you know, we've just always really uh, kept up um, about my progress. Um, and, you know, there have been times when he gently told me, you know, I need you to sort of pick up the pace here on stuff and, and other times uh, when he didn't. So I think it just, you know, we just jive, man. <laughs> and yes, I, you do. And we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're lucky. I'm lucky in, in that respect. But I think if, if we didn't, then we would probably have to be more intentional like you're talking about, about mm -hmm. it. Uh, my addition to this is just... 
in your first year, I would suggest a large literature research database in your own program of choice. But go through the literature of what the lab has produced over the past few years. Be familiar with the techniques and methods. And then if there's something like, oh, this is really interesting, that first year is your time to speak with current grad students who've been there longer. Be like, hey, when you have a moment, can you train me on this? I'd be really interested. I think this is going to be applicable to my research. And then another great thing is if you're looking for external funding, now's the time to start writing that proposal. And so you can speak with your advisor and say, hey, here's my idea for a project. I've been reading the literature. There seems to be an empty space here. I want to fill it. And if you're having issues with that, then you might speak with them and say, how can we approach this? What other things should we do? Did you have something else in mind? And if that's what's presented to you, then you start working on your proposal. You start working with your advisor. And while you're setting up that proposal, your main goal is to write out your aims and objectives. And so you're essentially lining out your dissertation and your research in that first year without actually having to do anything. And this is a great benefit to kind of set your path in front of you within that first year and then hopefully get some money out of it at the same time. Yeah, good point. And I've, I've spoken about this a little bit before, but mainly my very first year, I sat down with my advisor and I said, hey, what are your ex expectations of me? How off, you know, when am I supposed to be in the lab? Um, what am I supposed to do my first year? All of this. And he said, uh, treat this like a job nine to five, but sometimes you'll leave early. Sometimes you'll stay late. It depends on what you're trying to do. But he said, I never have an expectation of you being here like all the time, uh, which was really great. Um, and I really appreciate it. So. Yeah, my advisor explicitly told me I didn't have to work weekends. That's lovely. I know. I almost cried. <laughs> yeah, and it's amazing what that kind of explicit conversation can make it feel like. So that, like him saying that to you and you acknowledging like, oh, wow, like I don't have to be here on weekends. He explicitly said so. That must have been fantastical. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash stemculture and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a free title and start listening. I highly recommend The Poisoner's Handbook. It is amazing. It highlights the birth of forensic science as we know it today. If you're not into murder then use your free download for any book of your choice. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash stemculture. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash stemculture for your free audiobook. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash stemculture to get started today. So when interacting with your PI, it's important to ask direct questions, especially as we mentioned before, whenever you leave a room, say, is this what you want me to do? Science is expensive. So if you're wasting some time on an experiment, you're wasting money as well. So always go for those direct questions and never assume anything. When you assume, you make a dick of you and me. That's not how that goes, but we're keeping it. <laughs> I was like, something oh, yeah. But I like it better. You're welcome. So we would recommend that you listen to episodes three and four of this season, including how to apply for graduate school with a PDF of questions to ask your university program or PI on our website. So another thing that we think is really important is knowing yourself. For example, are you a conflict avoider? If you are, that means that you may bend or give up the ideas or things that have meaning to you. So not only do you not get what you want or what you need for something, but your PI never actually learns what you need and your science and your emotional health can suffer. Also, and this is the thing that I'm actually most, I guess, passionate about. This is something that I think a lot of people don't think about, but what is the emotional luggage that you're bringing with you to your program? This is an incredibly stressful experience, so it's going to test everything you know about yourself and everything you don't know about yourself. So you're going to discover things about yourself you never knew. You may even discover mental health issues. So for me, I came into grad school already with anxiety and depression, and luckily I was already um, on medication when I started my first year, and I ended up doubling a dose of my, of my medication to deal with uh, the intense depression that I was suffering and I wish I had realized that it was going to be taking a toll on my mental health. I didn't even think about it. Uh, also, this is another thing I didn't think about, but if you've got issues with authority figures, you've got daddy issues, that's me. Tendencies <laughs> towards anxiety and depression, expect 
all those things to get amplified. So for me, it's authority figures. It's, you know, my dad was not really there. And so all that stuff got kind of tied up into my PI who sometimes was not there and who was also an authority figure. So I, I wish that I had been better prepared emotionally when I first started my program. Um, I really like what you said, Monty, about like knowing like what you're coming in with. And I came into this PhD, like having always wanted to do something like this, to be able to dive into the science like this. And so I poured so much of myself into this PhD program uh, to the point that it was really, it became exhausting. And so now I'm kind of extricating myself from quite a few things because I was getting really emotionally invested in my writing projects mm -hmm. to the point where I was taking edits like really personally mm -hmm. and I was getting really depressed just about like the whole editing process because I was like, man, like this is not even my paper anymore. Um, and so acknowledging that, okay, I put so much of myself into my PhD. Um, maybe if I actually took a little of myself away from my PhD, I would be able to be a happier individual. <laughs> and that is what has been happening, um, which is really lovely. You're setting That's boundaries. That's really awesome. Boundaries. boundaries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're so good. Uh. It's incredible how much just changing the way you think about something can change your whole perspective and like the way the same things feel. Yeah. I mean that, that thing about, uh, you know, taking edits personally, mm. like that's a serious thing that a lot of people struggle with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. uh, you know, that <laughs> if, if, if you've got that going into grad school, especially in science, you should be aware of it. You should, you should figure that out because, that's going to that's gonna come up and bite you. Yeah. Yeah, and I think a lot of it, too, is about, like, the editing process between you and your advisor and, like, how you are as a writer, how they are as a writer. Right, and, yeah. And, like, there's so much that goes into it. I think not everyone has that issue, but no. I ended up having that issue of, like, I poured my, my mm -hmm. heart and soul into this paper for two years and then, um, yeah. <laughs> it felt personal. The, cri the criticism your... felt personal. Yeah. Yeah, and that's your personality. You invest yourself in things, <clears throat> and that's, that's laudable. Audible, laudable. <laughs> this episode audible is brought to you by this. Audible. <laughs> by laudable.com. Um, but, you know, your personality is going inter to interact differently with the process for each person that's listening to this. So, you know, know thyself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we'll mention, too, that um, we have an episode on time management in season one, episode five. It's all about work, um, how you work, time management, um, things you can try, figure out what works for you, um, working styles, that kind of thing. So check that out. So if you could turn back time, what would you guys you do different? If time. I could turn back time, <laughs> if Did I could I walk time? away. Ooh, Shame. Hey, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> what was the question? I got very distracted. <laughs> if you could turn back time, what would you do differently in your first year? I'm guessing we're getting that specific. So personally, I would try and learn more from my lab mates um, and ask them to, to like let me shadow them around the lab a bit more and learn more about the lab functionality in my first year because I did not learn any of that really until the summer and then I was like one of the one only ones there in the summer and I had to learn a lot of stuff on my own um which when you're in a program you never want to learn anything on your own because no. the whole point of being in the program <laughs> is that you have people to learn yeah. from um so I wish I had uh, been a little bit better about that. So I guess it's not really about my PI, but about the lab. My bad. I would have uh, been more uh, confident in my understanding of the things that I was bringing into the project as things I knew about. I, I hesitate to call them expertise, but um, if I had sort of... Uh, thrown the anchor a little more definitively about some of the projects that I started, um, I would have uh, encountered more more success and less failure. But as it was, I failed lots of things successfully. 
<laughs> Me too. <Yes>. I failed. <laughs> I failed a lot of things successfully. Um, <laughs> Failure is really important in grad school. Hopefully, that will bring me to my first paper. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Yeah, I think failure is definitely really important. Um, I I think um, I don't know if I could do anything differently my first year. To be honest with you, like I think that the reason why I'm where I'm at right now is because of my epic failures <laughs> over the last year. You know, I think it's definitely given me a lot of growth that I wouldn't have had um, had I not done that. But but with that being said, I had incredible lab mates. I had well, Danny, <laughs> who really did guide me um, through a lot, a lot, a lot. So uh, I can't say I would change much in that aspect. I needed to fail. I had great, great lab mates. I have a good mentor. I don't know. <laughs> like I feel really, really lucky to be where I am right now. The, the space that I'm occupying feels good. Heck yes. Yes. So uh, I would have probably utilized some resources more efficiently in my first year and also verify what was available for my project. So my first year, we didn't even have samples. So for my first year, I literally sat around doing nothing other than cleaning the lab and shadowing my uh, the graduate student who graduated before me. And so with that, it was... A lot of waiting around where I could have been reading more articles. I could have been upfront about some stuff or I could have been doing something else or collaborating with somebody else and learning a lot of new skills instead of essentially sitting on my ass. So with that, I would look at your resources in your lab, but also at your university. There are some things, for example, mental health. Your university should offer something in the line of that. Look into that. Look into your insurance that's available. Look at what resources are available for you to use so that one, it reduces stress while you're working, but also might help you in progression to get through in a timely manner versus six years or more. Woo. <laughs> Actually, I, I woo so I don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> one woo away from boohoo. <laughs> I thought of something I wish I would have done differently because I am about to wade through this freaking organize my primary literature in a better manner. <laughs> Citation managers uh, are your friends. Yes, yeah. yes. But then just even knowing what you have and like making note better, taking better notation of, of what it is I actually have. There's nothing worse than like, I can say this and then I'll cite that article and you're like, but which of the 130 <laughs> articles in my library was it that I'm trying to think of? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's my rant. <laughs> I've got, I've got something. Um, I think that I would have been more needy. <laughs> yes. I think I would have gone, I think I would have done things more Danny style. Like, Hey, we're going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to, to put together this, uh, this fish. God, what is it even called? It's like a fish quadrat sampler thing. And I was supposed to build it myself with wood and hammer and nails. And I'm like, what? I've never done construction. I don't, I don't know how to do this. I'm just, you know, like my first one was a complete failure. It was falling apart. And thank goodness I got help later in Alaska. But like, I, I should have just been like, hey, dude, I don't know what I'm doing. This is totally jacked up. So things like that. I should have, you know, and again, I, I was concerned about criticism, but I shouldn't have been. I should have just been like, totally okay with it. Like, please help me. Somebody help me. That's what I wish I would have done differently. You'd be surprised at how things that you've probably used your lab mate hasn't learned how to do. Mm -hmm. Like we, we do a lot of sampling campaigns in the field. And so that aspect of it is everything must be secured tightly or something will go wrong. Yeah. And there was a moment where I or my PI stopped and just went like, this is how you properly use a ratchet strap so your mass spectrometer doesn't fly out the window. <laughs> <laughs> and so you just have to be careful. Don't be a dick about it, but just explain, oh, yeah, no, you don't use these. Oh, well, this is how they use it. Also, they are the same thing you mount the cylinder to the wall with. So it's constructive uses. Just try to get it done. But, yeah, there's some times where I'm like, you want me to do what? <laughs> my first year, I literally spent 3D scanning earwax in a freezer. That was my project. <laughs> scanning wax. Those words don't usually go together. They no. don't. <laughs> It smelled horrible. 
<laughs> One time the freezer broke. I'm pretty sure it's your favorite smell. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is whale earwax. Makes it a little better, maybe? No. No. <laughs> So today, I feel like we had a really good conversation about relationship building with your PI in that first year of graduate school. You got to hear some of our stories and what we would have done differently if we got a redo. And some of us here actually did get a redo, which is awesome. I'm glad that they did. You don't always get to do that. Communication and self-reflection are so crucial for that PI and grad student relationship. And I hope that you've hopefully picked up some tips from this episode, things for you to think about So that hopefully we can save you from unnecessary hardship and conflict in the future. There will always be some, but some of it you can definitely look out for. Next time, we'll be presenting an in-stem interview with Miguel Perez on being a Mexican-American first-generation scientist. We are on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as STEM Culture One Word Podcast. Search and you shall find. And when in doubt, visit our website at stemculturepodcast.com for show notes, references, and information about all of our guests and contributors. And transcripts! Sorry. Until next time, don't forget to consensually hug a grad student, or at least buy them a coffee, or free-range organic froyo. What the hell is that? (laughs) 